Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce Steve Nichols with a few words about his, his background. He was first licensed in 1981 at the age of 20, uh, was interested in, al always interested in the technical aspects of the hobby. His uh, background is he has a degree in physics, professionally is an, a journalist in the fields of aviation and professional microwave. Um, and that has, I think, assisted in his being able to write four books for the RSGB on antennas, propagation and uh, an introduction to, to uh, the hobby. Um, he is chairman of the Propagation Studies Committee, and that's the capacity in which he's um, appearing today, or technically answering in that area. Um, he also gets involved in contesting. Um, his club uh, won the 80-metre um, club championship, the St uh, Club, last year, and he, he came fifth in the QRP section of the Commonwealth Contest. So with that, Thank you. Steve, please take the floor. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, we're going to be concentrating on HF propagation today. Um, so any questions about VHF, Jim Bacon is over there, so he can answer yeah. those. Um, this re this, this um, presentation came about really through some of the work we've been doing with the videos that Propagation Studies Committee have. We have two videos for clubs, one on HF propagation, one on VHF propagation. And the way it works with clubs is you show the video, and then if you want a Skype-based Q&A, um, you can have that afterwards. How many people have actually seen uh, one or either of those? Yeah, I, I was really chuffed because we've had about 120 clubs see the HF one, and I thought, well, you know, we just about covered it, until I was told there are actually 500, I think, affiliated clubs within RSGB, so we've got a load more to do. So if you do have a club and you want to use one of these videos, and with or without a, a Skype-based Q&A as well, please uh, let me know, and there's uh, be an email address at the end of it. But... Um, some of the questions that kept coming up, I thought it would be a good idea to perhaps view some of those in the um, presentation. And we'll, without further ado, we'll, we'll get on with it. And what we're going to look at today, just a few questions, we've only got half an hour or so. Where are we in Solar Cycle 24? What can we expect for Solar Cycle 25? What have we done recently to augment the RADCOM predictions that were printed every month? Why have conditions been so bad? Uh, what effect does the enhanced solar wind have on HF propagation? And why can it be so hard to predict it? And then we'll have some questions at the end. So if you've got any questions, probably the best thing to do is, is hold on to them until the end of the, the presentation. We'll try and leave some time for that. So straight off then, where are we in solar cycle 24? Um, I really need three arms at once here. But um, we are down here, as you can see. Now, you may go right, we're at sunspot minimum. No, we're not. We're not at sunspot minimum. Sunspot minimum is currently predicted to be variously from, oh, I've moved off my spot, I have to come back, variously from September 2019, it may actually um, go into 2020 or beyond. And we'll talk about that in a minute or so. But you can see we are, if you compare where we are now, we're roughly where we were in about October 2007, if you look on the chart. And as you can see that, you know, the minimum didn't really come for another two years. So if you think we're at sunspot minimum now and things are bad, tough. We're li <laughs> they're likely to remain like this for, for some time. But this graph, this I only put this on here uh, two days ago. It's only just been released, but we can see some, some classic things here. We can see that this cycle has been significantly worse than solar cycle 23. And you can also see the double peak that is characteristic of most 11-year sunspot cycles. So that's where we are heading towards the bottom, but we're certainly not there yet. Um, other things, solar cycle 24 has declined far more quickly than forecast. Um, we need to w try and work out whether solar minimum is going to be longer than usual or might uh, solar cycle 25 begin earlier. Um, and if you look at some of the predictions, that I checked back and the solar cycle prediction panel's forecast for solar cycle 24 was for a maximum average sunspot number of 90 um, to occur in May 2013. It actually ended up being 82, but it was April 2014. So they got the um, sunspot number wrong, and they also got the month wrong or the year wrong. So, and that isn't unusual. It's very, very hard to predict these things. So we'll have a look now at what some of the people are saying about uh, this cycle. This is um, a graph showing you solar cycle 22, 23, 24, and some suggestions for what we might get for the next cycle. And back in 2016, um, Hathaway and Upton uh, wrote a paper where they said that the average strength of magnetic polar fields near the end of cycle 24 
have been similar to the slightly weak uh, or slightly weaker than the end of cycle 23, suggesting that cycle 25 um, may be similar in strength or slightly weaker to the current um, cycle. So it wasn't the end of the world, but it's rather suggesting that cycle 25, the one that we're going to be starting in a couple of years, could be possibly similar to the one we've just gone through. Um, but they're not really predicting we're going to have, or some people are not predicting we're going to have a massive, fantastic cycle 25. But let's look at that in a little bit more detail. In fact, there was an update to that paper by Hathaway and Upton that was released just a couple of months ago. Um, and it's now saying cycle 25 is likely to be slightly weaker than 24, and uh, could be the weakest cycle on record in the last 100 years. Um, and it says weak cycles are preceded by long extended minima, so we may not reach the cycle 24 minimum until 2021. So again, we were originally thinking that the minimum would be September 19. Now it could be till 2021. So if you, if you don't like the conditions that we're getting right now, tough. Um, it's uh, you know, going to um, continue with that. <coughs> I'm not going to read the rest of it. I'll, I'll let you have a look. But it's worth searching for that paper from by David Hathaway and Lisa Upton to see what they say. Other comments? There's been some suggestions that the magnetic field of sunspots is getting weaker and weaker. Um, and this is an indication that, um, you know, are sunspots actually disappearing completely? Are we going to end up a, with a maunder minimum? I don't think anyone is predicting we're going to get a maunder minimum with the next cycle, but certainly it's not looking terribly good in terms of the strength. Um, but for everyone who's, uh, or every paper you read like that, you find another paper that said, or a, a report that says that uh, back in uh, 2014, astronomers measured the strongest magnetic field ever seen on the sun. A monster sunspot cycle broke broke the uh, the record for the for the magnetic field strength. So on one hand, they're saying overall the magnetic field strength of sunspots is declining, but in that particular cycle, you know, it's allegedly the the strongest magnetic field ever seen, which just goes to show you can't believe everything you read or hear. Everyone has an opinion. And when I s was researching this presentation, there are an awful lot of papers out there of people that have written with their predictions for solar cycle 25, and they're all over the place. But nobody's saying it's going to be absolutely fantastic, and you know, we're going to see some of the, um, you know, the wonderful effects that we saw perhaps in 2001, when 10 meters was open every day, and it was, it was so good that I just got bored with it. Um, I'm older and grayer now, and if there's an opening on 10, I will work it, I think, rather than wait. So what can we expect? Um, well, at the end of cycle 23, sunspot activity declined to a level not seen since 1913. It's all doom and gloom stuff, this. Number of sunspots over the entire cycle was uh, decreased significantly by 50% or greater. There were fewer flares and coronal mass ejections, and the mag magnetic field exerted by the sun was significantly weakened. So again, more evidence, really, that we're not going to see a fantastic uh, cycle 25. This was another paper that was published in September 2018 that said they predicted that the maximum of solar cycle 25 will be in 2023, kind of February-March time, with a peak sunspot number of 154. Well, when you bear in mind that the peak so sunspot number of this last cycle was 116, that's rather suggesting that the next cycle is going to be better. Take your pick. Who's, who do you want to believe? I'd go with David Hathaway at the moment. Um, right, something else I want to talk about now is what have we done with the RADCOM predictions? Over the years, we get quite a lot of feedback on these, and it usually goes along the lines of, I get better results than the RADCOM predictions, or I get worse results than the RADCOM predictions. These are median figures based on 100 watts to a dipole um, on SSB. So obviously, if you're running a linear with a stepper at 300 feet or something, you are going to get better results. Likewise, and this is no disrespect to M6, if you're running M um, 10 watts to a piece of string, you're going to do significantly worse than this. And this has always been an issue. How, what can we do? So I thought the best thing to do was actually, with, with technology now, is actually have an online facility that you could use to augment these, where you put in your power, you put in your own antenna um, system, and it will give you your own results for your particular station. And I had this in mind for about six months or so, and we were looking for a programmer who could, who could do this. And it was Michael um, VJR, uh, G7 VJR, I think, at in, uh, who suggested somebody called uh, Yari, or Jari OH6BG. And so I contacted him, and he said, what do you want? Uh, so I said, well, what it would be nice to do is have the same locations as we, ha we have in Radcom, 
um, but you put in your power, your antenna, and whatever. And he said, mm, he said let me think about that. Four, four hours later, he came up with this. <laughs> um, he said, is that the sort of thing you had in mind? Yes, absolutely. Um, and he, he th this is part of VOACAP. He's a, a VOACAP expert. So this is uh, some routines he'd already written for VOACAP. So he's able to um, adapt them for what we needed. So I've, I made a few tweaks and we added the long path um, um, ones as well. But now this is available at vocap.com slash radcom. So you can go in and you can, um, with a little table, you can put in the details that you want. I think it now saves it as well so that you next time you go and you don't have to do it all again. And as I said, it will actually give you a chart um, and we, we're, we're slowly adding to this. Um, it's been pointed out today that it really should tell you what it's based on in terms of the signal-to-noise ratio and the sunspot number. We can do that. Also, we're trying to get it so when it prints it, it does it in two columns rather than one. Um, can be done. He said, yes, I'll, I'll look at it, but I don't, I don't push him too hard um, on these things. He's doing it completely free. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful that uh, Jerry is doing it for us, but uh, I think that's a useful tool to have. So then that leaves us back with Radcom. What, what are we going to do with Radcom? Um, I've talked to lots of people about this, and it varies from leave it as it is to get rid of it completely to um, add color. So we could add color so it makes it look a little bit better. Um, we could add even more color so it becomes even more color coded. I thought this wasn't too bad, and I showed it to somebody and went, oh, it's awful, don't ever do that. Um, or do we then look at just having regions in with um, propagation uh, predictions with reliability just based on the region? So here we've got Western Europe, Eastern Europe, East Coast, USA, etc. You'll notice that because we are in such a poor position in the sunspot cycle that in fact, most of it is just completely blank because your chances of uh, you know, working um, Hawaii, perhaps, on any band, actually, um, is not terribly good, hin indicated by the sort of 10 to 20% probability down in that, that corner. So I, I, I want a quick show of hands now. If you had to, would you um, prepare, prefer to keep them like that? Hands up if you want to keep them as they are. There's one. Ooh, right, OK. Um, would you prefer to have a little bit of color just to make it? Oh, right, so we've got a few more, that, that's good. We can do this, it's on a four color page, so we can add some color to that. Um, I need to discuss this with Elaine as to what we could possibly do. Um, we, I, I was going to have a load of these on, a, on, on display at the convention, but it was decided that no, the best way to do it is perhaps have a feature in Radcom and get people to vote on it, but I thought it would just be good to see some, you know, some um, hands go in the air. What about something like that, where you've got color, but it, you know, the color also tells you the probability of a contact? Oh, no, not, 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 not so many. And finally, forget all the various locations, because you can do that online, but you just have a simplified graph just showing you the regions. Oh, there's a lot of, lot of yeah, a lot of support for that. That's good. Um, Gwyn Williams currently produces these. When I suggested this, he would never have my dead body, sort of thing. So. Um, <laughs> Bless him. I don't quite know what we'll end up doing, but we, we will do something over the next 12 months. But I'm just happy that we've got the RADCOM, uh, or the VOACAP RADCOM online facility now. Anyb does anybody here use that? And do you find it useful? Yeah, that's good. And we can, uh, we can build on that a little bit. So next question was, why have conditions been so bad? Um, I touched on this in last year's presentation. Um, on the left, we've got a picture of the sun in visible light, and as you can see, it's absolutely covered in spots. Um, it's not. Um, but one thing that we refer to in GB2RS every single week is something called coronal holes. Now, you can't see these unless you look at the sun in extreme ultraviolet, and this is an image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. If we look at it in extreme ultraviolet, we see these dark patches, which are lower energy patches on the sun, uh, areas where with open magnetic field lines that allow the solar wind to just pour out. So if you never looked at the sun in extreme ultraviolet, you'd never know this was actually going on, but it certainly is. And these coronal holes have basically been one of the reasons we've been getting high K indices and we've been getting disrupted conditions. So we need to really focus more on coronal holes that are going on and, and what's happening um, and kind of ignore the fact that we have no sunspots. 
Um, and as the sun's rotating, these things are moving from left to right. And when the, sun, the coronal hole, if it's Earth-centric, so if it's sort of centered on the disk and it's in the middle of the disk, we normally get hit by that high-speed solar wind about two days later. And, and this week was a perfect example of this. I did the GB2RS report on Thursday, as I always do, and I have a look at the NOAA figures for next week, see what they say the K index is going to be, and this weekend, and it suggested there wouldn't be a problem this weekend. But when I looked at the, the chart from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, there was a massive um, coronal hole that was then exactly um, Earth-centric pointing at us which meant that two days after Thursday, or yesterday, basically Saturday, we were likely to be hit by the solar wind. And I thought, well, why haven't Noah said anything about that? So is, am I missing something, or do they know something I don't know? Um, anyway, I decided to say in GBTRS that we'd probably have unsettled conditions on Saturday. Bingo, we had a K-index of five yesterday. Um, so I was glad about that, because if I said it was going to be really bad, and it never was, um, that would have been quite embarrassing, um, as we have had in the past. But this is something that I think we need to pay a little bit more attention to at the moment. If you're looking for sunspot activity, you're probably not going to see it. So we need to concentrate perhaps on some of the other aspects of the sun. And coronal holes, hole effects are having a, a, you know, a massive ch um, effect on what's going on. Um, for example, this was um, last weekend. This coronal hole that I've indicated there was the one that was responsible for these conditions here. We had a very, very high... K index on October the 7th, um, and then it tailed off a little bit, but we had a K of 5. When we get a K index of 5 like that, this is when you're going to start seeing aurora. This is when the bands, the maximum usable frequency is going to go down. Generally, generally, you know, a high K index is associated with auroral conditions and poor HF conditions. But there is something else that we need to talk about, and that's something called the positive phase of a geomagnetic storm. Sometimes when this plasma, the solar wind, first hits, conditions can actually improve. We can have a short-lived positive phase um, when the maximum usable frequency goes up. And I think this is something we need to uh, look at more at this phase in the solar cycle because we can take advantage of this. And in fact, last weekend, um, just before this really, really took off, um, Conditions weren't too bad. I think there was a contest on last weekend. I can't remember which one it was. At the R yeah. And how, how were conditions last um, Saturday, Sunday? No? No? Okay. I think there was conditions weren't too bad. Um, this is propquest.co.uk, which um, Jim Bacon has developed. And we can see some of these effects here. Um, because we can actually track what the maximum usable frequency or the predicted or interpolated, um, extrapolated, I should say, really, um, maximum usable frequency is from the Digisond information. This is Digisond information that we get from Fairford, Chilton and Daub that tells us, you know, if we fire a signal straight up, does it come straight back down again? And if it does, what frequency, maximum frequency does that occur on? And from that, we can then detect almost, not real time, but within 15 minutes or so, what the predicted uh, maximum usable frequency is over 3,000 kilometers. And as you see here, as the sun comes up, the maximum usable frequency increases, and it, it's got up to about 21 megahertz there. So we can use this as a tool to actually see what's going on and perhaps compare that to things like the solar wind speed, the K-index, to see whether we can try and predict some of these um, enhancements. For example, this was last Sunday, the 7th of October, as I said. And what I've done is I've put the K-index across the top, um, spread it out, so you can actually compare what's going on. And you can see that the maximum usable frequency kind of hit just under 21 megahertz. And then we have this leap up above 15 meters, and then it goes down, then it comes back up again. And then after dark, it's still above 18 megahertz. You see that? which usually you would expect um, that as soon as the sun goes down, that 17 meters shortly after would start to close. But I think in this instance, we had this geomagnetic storm about to you know, happen, or we're right at the beginning of it, and we have this positive phase of the geomagnetic storm, so the maximum usable frequencies are actually higher. So this is something we should be, I think we should be looking out for at the moment. Um, if you're looking for a, a daily sunspot number to try and work out whether the condition is going to be better or worse, that's not going to work for you. Um, the solar predictions that we do are median 
predictions for the whole month. In other words, you know, on average that month we expect the sun to do this, that, and the other conditions to be like this. But this is more of a kind of an almost real-time indicator that if there's a solar storm about to, uh, sorry, yes, a solar storm or solar wind about to hit us, and the geomagnetic storm is going to kick off, maybe we're going to get some of these enhancements, and you may find that you know you can work things on 15 meters or higher. Um, why do we get this positive phase with some storms and not others? That's a tricky one. I'm not sure we really, really understand it. This is one um, explanation that um, I found, that something called a, a traveling atmospheric disturbance um, when this material hit, hits the Earth and gets channeled towards the poles. You know, this traveling atmospheric disturbance can um, move materials down towards the equator. This could drive up this ionization and lead to this you know, increase in ionization density. But it's something I think that, especially at this point in the sunspot cycle, and somewhere where we're gonna be for the next two years, that it's worth looking out for. If we know there could be a solar uh, magnetic storm coming because of all this um, inbound plasma um, from the sun, maybe we might start to see some of the higher bands opening up, even for short periods. But I think it's not something that we've ever, ever talked about in any great detail, but I think this positive phase storm is something that we can uh, concentrate on. For example, this was yesterday. And if you look again, you'll see that around about, uh, where are we, about three o'clock, there was a little bit of an upturn up to about 15 meters just before the K index shot up um, as this material hit the Earth. Um, and I spoke to Mark DXR, who's with Kenwood downstairs and actually running uh, um, the demonstration station downstairs. He was working um, lots of American stations yesterday afternoon, and he also worked down into um, Africa, I believe. You know, conditions were really, really good. And I said, was that about three o'clock? He said, yeah, how did you know? Uh, well, this basically, you know, the PropQuest chart tells us that there was a, an increase, there was an improvement around about sort of three, four o'clock. It could possibly be due to, uh, you know, that positive pre-auroral um, storm, um, geomagnetic storm condition that we're seeing there. So we mentioned this, I mentioned this a lot in GB2RS, you know, oh, this coronal hole effects are going to hit us on whatever. It's not, always, it's not always easy to say, oh, yes, it's going to hit half past three or four o'clock. You know, if it's Earth-centric, I usually allow about two days, about 48 hours to, for the, you know, to know that this, this material is going to hit the Earth. Um, so we can, we can get it right within a half a day or so, but I think it's, it's, a t it's a tool that's worth looking for to see whether we can actually see any of these um, enhancements. Yeah. You, you can. The trouble with the K-index is the three hourly average of what's been happening over that previous period. So you could miss it completely. Um, the technique we're talking about here is, is to try and uh, get there before the K-index goes up or to try and spot any enhancements before we get that impact. Um, and it, yeah, y you're right. It's, it's hard to really tie it down to a specific hour, but I think it's worth um, you know, at least having a look for it. When we're so desperate to work anything and we're desperate for the bands to open, uh, you know, any little tool you can use like this is worthwhile. So why is it hard to predict conditions? Um, a lot of it is because things change quite rapidly. On the left-hand side there is the sunspots as, as they were on August the 24th. And as you can see, there's basically just two tiny, tiny dots. 24 hours later, that sunspot, the, the highest sunspot, which is number 2720 there, has actually developed an awful lot. So in 24 hours, we've gone from a dot to quite a large sunspot group, and this, the, you know, the number's gone up. Um, now imagine that I'm trying to write this on Thursday, so it goes out with the RSGB on Friday, it's then read out on Sunday, and that's got to actually tell you what's going on for the next seven days. That's really, really hard to do. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the problems, that we it's very hard to predict ahead. As I said, we can come up with median figures, you know, on average this month, you know, 20 meters will be open, maybe 70 meters. And really, to be honest, the, the difference in band conditions from August the 24th to the 25th 
with that new sunspot, it's prob there probably wouldn't have been a difference anyway. Um, you know, when, when the whole sun is filled with sunspots and it's been like it for a, a, you know, four or five days, you might see an effect. But on average, you, you don't see an, a daily change. The biggest daily changes we see are from the coronal hole effects, I think. Um, and also, this one, I'm going to play this and put it on a loop. My mouse has gone to sleep. Well, oh, here we go. We've got it. This is, um, again, this is looking at coronal holes. And I'll put it on a loop so that we can see. Right. If you look at that, you'll see there's a dark area uh, sort of center at the bottom. And then there's another dark area on the left-hand side. It's now flicked back. Watch the two coronal holes. You'll see that this one on the right actually shrinks. It gets smaller. The one on the left is actually growing as it rotates. Do you see that? Again, so that's over a period of a couple of days. So in terms of the coronal holes, we've got one coronal hole is actually shrinking in size and one is actually growing. So how on earth can we predict what the hell coronal holes are going to do over a period of about sort of seven to eight days? Sometimes we know due to the sun's rotation that if we see a, a coronal hole in 27 days or thereabouts, you know, it's going to come around again. In terms of how big it is, how effective it's going to be, it's really, really hard to predict. So in this instance, I thought this was a good way of showing us that the coronal hole that's now in the middle is shrinking. The other one is actually growing. We've also got the polar coronal hole at the top that probably wouldn't have an awful lot of effect on the Earth because it's not pointed towards us. But the sun is a very, very active, dynamic body that is changing all the time. So it's very, very hard for us to be very, very sp specific. Right, I suppose we're going to carry on doing that. Right, let's move on. There we go. Right, so in conclusion then, and we've got, we've got another 15 minutes for some, for, for some uh, talks. So sunspot minimum is predicted to be certainly no earlier than sept September 2019. Um, and if we have an extended minimum, it's likely to be on that, could be into 2020, 2021. Really, solar minimum is something you can only really know about when you've gone past it. Uh, you know, once the sunspot uh, numbers um, continue to grow, then you know that you must have gone past minimum. But at the moment, it's not good news. We're likely to have at least another 12 months of the conditions we're getting right now, and it could actually go further than that. Predictions for solar cycle 25, some say it will be similar to 24. There's an awful lot of evidence that it actually may be worse than solar cycle 24. Um, we've augmented the printed RADCOM predictions with the new online VOACAP tool, and we're going to keep adding to that. We're going to improve that as we go along, as uh, we come up with ideas, and uh, Yari um, OH6PG can implement them for us. Looking at alternative treatments for the RADCOM printed HF predictions, I really don't know what we're going to do because, as I said, I've had everything from scrap them completely to um, leave them as they are, to add color, to completely change them, and I really don't know what would what's best. I think it's going to be an example of how you can't please everyone all the time. So whatever we do, we want to make sure that we, we do it um, as best we can. Um, at the moment, HF propagation generally is being dominated by the effects of solar coronal holes. But as I said, these can bring some short-lived positive enhancements, at, uh, especially at the beginning of the cycle, so or of the impact. So we can't just say, oh, high K index, things are going to be lousy. Um, they might be, or they might not. And I think the best thing you do is either get on the band or use some of the real-time um, uh, 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 tools we've got, like uh, PropQuest, thanks to, to Jim and his team at uh, WeatherQuest, to actually see what's going on. But in, in some respects, I, I spoke to someone the other day. He said, oh, conditions have been so bad. I said, well, today? He said, oh, yeah, really bad. I said, oh, well, who did you work? He said, well, I didn't work anyone. I said, well, it, why not? He said, well, I never turned the radio on. <laughs> he said, why didn't you turn the radio on? He said, well, conditions were so bad. What was the point? <laughs> um, there must be some weird logic there that, um, you know, get on, the, get on the air, try it, and just see for yourself. Um, but in addition to the sunspot number, which doesn't really tell us much about what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Keep an eye on the, the, the K index. Keep an eye on the solar wind speed and, and solar wind density. And also the, the BZ, the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field. When the so-called BZ goes southwards, it couples more easily with the Earth's magnetic field, and the effects are going to be far, far um, more severe. So w we tend not to talk about the BZ in GB2RS now. I kind of banned it. Because if you listen to some of the early 
GB2RS reports would say, oh, the, you know, the interplanetary magnetic field was 10 nanotests of the BZ pointing star. And people were going, what does that mean? I would rather we said, and that means conditions are going to be rotten. Um, uh, we're trying to make it now more about propagation than solar physics. Um, but yes, there are a lot of tools that you can use. Says he pressing a button and nothing's happening. That's good. Oh, here we go. Right. Um, other tools you can use, um, such as on my site, g0kya.blogspot.com, we've got some short path propagation charts. Again, so you can very quickly move around from hour to hour, band to band, to see where things are likely to be open. You've also got the current um, conditions. You've got the K-index on there. You've got um, this little um, panel in the middle here, which shows you the BZ components, so whether is it north, south, the speed and the dynamic pressure of the solar wind, that's very useful. So when that one on the left goes down, the BZ is going south, but it's more likely to couple with the Earth, and more likely to get um, you know, a raised K index. So lots of tools that um, you can get your hands on to, to play with. Also, we've got PredTest, which um, Gwyn Williams um, develops. This is kind of similar to VOACAP in that it will come up with um, predictions for you, but it uses the ITURHF prop um, model or engine to, to generate these. But again, it's yet another tool in our armory of propagation um, prediction tools that we can use um, to actually um, work out what's likely to be happening or where we can work. For example, if you want to talk, you know you want to talk to somebody in, on the east coast of the US, this will tell you the band, the best band, the best time to do it. Um, and it's uh, useful from that respect. I think at that point, <coughs> it's time for Q and A's. There's, there's my um, RSGB email address there. Um, if any of your clubs want to use either the HF or VHF presentation we've got, just drop me a line, we'll organize it. You can or you don't have to have a Skype-based Q and A with it. Um, about 30% of the clubs do. Um, and other information and charts you can find at g0kya.blogspot.co.uk. And I think that leaves us about 10 minutes for any questions, or you can run off and get a copy. Oh, gentleman here. Sorry, it's my fault. I should have uh, said it. wait. Yeah. Um, I understand that there was solar activity which has been ascribed to um, cycle 25, even though we're still in a decline in cycle 24. Can you explain that or comment on it, please? Yes, I can. Um, there's been one sunspot that was seen, I think it was last year. Uh, was it last year or the year before now? I'm looking at Marcus because he's likely to know he's, he's shaking his head. There's been one, one sunspot that had a reverse magnetic polarity, which suggests it's from solar cycle 25. There was another one recently, within the last few months, that also had reverse polarity, and there was some question over whether that is. But due to where it was in terms of its uh, latitude on the sun, they decided it was from this cycle, not from the next cycle. So you often get this overlap between cycles where you will get sunspots from one cycle before the other one is completed. But as far as I know, we've only had one that has definitely had ha, um, been ascribed to solar cycle 25. And the one that was from about two or three weeks ago, eventually they came out and said, no, we think it was from solar cycle 24. Um, because its latitude was not where you would expect to find a site. I can't remember, do they start towards, where do they start? Do they start towards the equator and then work their way up or the other way around? I can never remember which way around it is. I think, I think, um, I think the new spots are, mo are more towards the equator. We've got Les there, he must know which one it is. Where do they start? Uh, they start high and go low? Yeah, yeah here you go, I got it the wrong way around. Yeah, I, g I always get that wrong. No, no. <laughs> But it's a good question, and you're right. There was some talk about where we are in it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Just from the practical point of view, I found, yes, I do use uh, uh, some of the prediction information. But what I have found is, for example, in the, in the morning, VKZL on, uh, on 40 and 30, very straightforward, there they are. In the afternoon, when uh, the uh, F2 layer is going down and down and down, 15 meters can still be open, even though it's saying, oh, the MUF is 14, mm. 16 megs. So on 21, there they are, there's the South Americans, they'll use at 7,000 miles away, coming in at S7 and 8. Yeah. Um, so I found that you can get that little bit extra, yeah. um, even though uh, 
PropQuest is saying, no, there's the MUF. Yeah, they are median figures, but you end up with a probability of a band being open. So you may find that the probability of that of 15 meters being open on that path is, say, 20%. So it means 20% of all days in a month it may be open. Also, we can't really talk about the maximum usable frequency for the whole globe. It will depend on the path. So the maximum usable frequency on the path from us to South America may still be 21 megs, but if you were trying to work the US or the other way, the maximum usable frequency would be totally different. Um, so when we talk about MUFs, we have to really specify what path it is as well. And at the moment, I mean, we've just come past the um, equinox, north-south paths and, nor and, and paths from UK to South Africa and UK to South America, yes, the MUFs have been higher on those, so I'm not surprised that you're still hearing it. You've got a beam in a linear, haven't you? Terminated folded dipole. That went wrong, didn't it? That'll teach me. I thought you were going to tell me you had a stepper 120 feet. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, yeah. Again, it depends on your station. We, we uh, Roger, G3LDI um, in Norfolk, he hears stuff that just not there for the rest of us, and it's uh, you know it's all down to the antenna and the height it's at. So uh, yeah, he makes his own propagation, I think. St Steve has answered the response that I was going to make to the comment about the F2 on PropQuest that it is overhead southern yes. UK, British Isles, and <laughs> your path down to South America is made up of two or three skips. Yeah, and the FOF2 along that path will give you. Uh, better performance than the one close to home locally. So yeah, it's it's more or less for the local inter-G near Europe type QSOs that that's yeah. the most useful indicator. Just just to explain that a little bit more detail, the Digison sends a signal straight up, comes back down, and gives us the critical frequency. We then extrapolate from that the predicted maximum usable frequency. But as as I just said, it will depend on what direction you're going. So it's only a guide. Um, is never more than that, and we need to look at other propagation prediction programs to, to work out the, a, a more reasonable predicted maximum usable frequency over a path. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> Perhaps I, I should have made that clear. But yeah, that, that's why I'm saying we're extrapolating. We're, we're taking you know, information about apples and trying to describe oranges with it, really. One more. Sunspot maximum has been reducing every cycle since 1958. Right. Or possibly 47, some yeah. people would say. And it's been suggested that there is another much longer cycle superimposed on the 11-year cycle. Yeah, Do you have there's, any, there's, there's any views on that? There's a lot of information of other cycles that are extended over that cycle. The way I like to look at it is the sun's been doing what it's been doing for I don't know how many billion years now. And we're looking at a very, very small snapshot in time of information. If you look at how much data we've gathered over our lifetimes, um, y you know, it's a, it's a tiny snapshot. There's an awful lot of suggestions about longer cycles. We've got the 22-year cycle, which is actually, you know, because the, 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 the sunspots change their magnetic polarity, so it takes 22 years to get back to the same polarity, so that's one cycle. Then there are I information about cycles overlaid on cycles. There's an awful lot. So yes, there are. And I don't think, I'm not a solar physicist, and I'm, I'm sure if we got some together, they would argue this for, for ad infinitum, but you're absolutely right. I think there are other cycles there, and in some respects, you can see patterns in everything if you look close enough. Um, you're desperate to say something, aren't you? Well, yes, there was yeah. a very interesting article in Scientific American, mm. um, uh, maybe a month or so That's ago, right, yes. where scientists have been looking in the ice and they've been able to detect uh, radioactive particles which were emitted along with um, the solar cycles and they've mm. been able to go back thousands of years. Yes. We certainly are in it. There is, although we're in 11 year cycles, we're also in something, I don't know, it's a 100 or 200 yes. year cycle. We're coming to the end of it. Yes. And the peaks do follow the cycle, uh, but as they say in the Scientific American article, with a degree of randomness. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this degree of randomness would, be, would indicate that following the curve, the next solar cycle, 25, will be weaker. Mm. The degree of randomness is such that it could even not happen, mm. or it could be as strong as the solar cycle we've just had. In other uh, words? And the indication is, though, that solar yeah. cycle 26, mm. in all probability, is not going to happen. 
and that we may not, I, n nobody in this room is going to see a really good solar cycle again until I think about 2060 when it may start up again. But that was, that was, a, that was an- 2060? Yeah, that was an ex, <laughs> yeah. That was, that was an excellent article in the Scientific see American. See, when, when you say that no one in this room is going to see another good solar cycle, that is so true, but on a totally different <laughs> for a totally different reason, yeah. Well, no, it, it was... Uh, I look forward to it when I'm 100. There yeah, that's it. Yeah. It was uh, an extremely, extremely well-researched arti article because they could, they could correlate the yeah. observed... Uh, so they, can, they could correlate what we've seen with these long-term cycles. So although there's a degree of randomness, that degree of randomness is not enough for us to have the solar cycles we had around about 1980. No. So if we're lucky, it'll be the same as the solar cycle we've just had. Yes. That's if we're lucky. Yes. If, if, but if you're a, a bit of a pessimist, it's just going to be a weaker cycle than we've just had. What always amazes me is when people come up with these ideas, you never hear from them 11 years later. Um, you know, they all seem to disappear. Okay, we've got one more minute if anybody has a, a question or comment. Go on then. Uh, while we're crying over a few sunspots, uh, how about taking advantage of a meteor scatter and ionoscatter scatter on 10 and 15 meters? Anyone done that? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure how much meteor scatter and ionoscatter scatter we get on 10 meters. Um, I'm not the world's leading expert on that. I'm looking to Jim, who's, uh, who's not saying too much either. Ah, I see. Yes, I, I couldn't go to that, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, talked, I've talked deliberately about F2 layer propagation today. Obviously, there's a lot of other propagation modes that are available. Um, and yes, make, make, take advantage of all of them. I, I'm not... I've not done much research on, on 10 meter meteor scatter, or I haven't done much on that at all, so that'd be interesting. But auroral propagation, absolutely on 10. And of course, sporadic E, you know, if you, if you miss that May to September sporadic E period on 10 meters, then you're silly, you know, because you make, make take great advantage of it. Thanks very much for reminding me that, you know, other varieties of propagation are available, yes. <laughs> okay, I think we, uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Steve, very much.